Hey everyone, my name is Ryland, and I'm leading the product effort here at Temporal. First of all, I just want to welcome everyone tonight. Uh, it's super duper exciting that we get to have this opportunity and we get to have our first self open office hours. Uh, and I really appreciate everyone spending the time to come out and you know ask us questions and give us feedback. Especially as a product manager, this session is probably one of the most valuable sources of information for me. And so it's really, really cool that you know I get to hear everyone directly at firsthand experience and accounts of what it's like to work with Temporal um, and what the problems and issues that you guys are running into and, and how we can help solve those problems for you guys in the future. The one other thing that I wanted to say before we got started is that you may have noticed that your mics are muted. Unfortunately, we've seen in the last few months um, some open source projects who have done similar things um, get attacked on Zoom calls. Uh, I was at an open source meetup just recently, like a week ago, and the Zoom meeting got linked and it was leaked. And because of that, a bunch of people jumped on the call and started causing trouble and, you know, yelling a bunch of profanities and slurs. And so we just figured that for the, you know, in the interest of keeping everyone safe tonight, we are going to make sure that mics stay muted by default. When we get to the QA session, we're going to selectively unmute people. So don't worry about that. So first, I want to just go over the agenda. The first thing is that I'm going to cover a little bit about what the format of open office hours will be. Um, this is for right now and in the immediate future moving forward, what, what what's it's going to look like to do open office hours. After that, I'm going to talk briefly about what's coming in our V1 release. I'm not going to get too deep in there, not going to go into too much detail, just very high level for people who haven't been following very closely. After the V1 stuff, I'm very even more briefly going to kind of discuss what's coming up for Temporal, what we've been focused on internally and you know where, where we're headed as a company, um, what our priorities are today. Hopefully that will shed a little bit more light on what's going on here. Then after that, the last thing that I am prepared is just introducing Discourse. Discourse is a new forum solution that we are investigating and trialing uh, moving forward. And we think that it's really going to improve our ability to communicate with the community, especially as we scale. And then before we start the Q&A, we actually have one awesome session from Mark, one of our engineers, and he's going to demonstrate how easy it is to get set up with Temporal and Kubernetes using our, our, our new Helm chart, which is available in, in version one. So super exciting, very much looking forward to that. So getting right into it, I want to talk about what the structure of these open office hours is going to be right now and again moving forward. Um, and kind of talk about why we reached the, the structure that we did. So as I said, you know, a lot of people are asking for this, this exact uh, session, this open office hours for a while in the community. Um, and it was something that we really wanted to do, but we needed to make sure that it was something that was the best way to give value back to people in the community. And why that's important is because, you know, we could go and spend our time uh, implementing features or solving bugs and that's going to bring a lot of value to users and so it's not necessarily a clear-cut decision of whether this is a good usage of time because you know everyone on the team has to come out and sit here and, and um, you know spend the time to be on the call and so it, we have to rationalize whether one is more worthwhile than the other and so we did this by going and talking to a lot of people that we trust a lot of people who have experience doing similar things and having run a lot of meetups uh, and figuring out whether they think it was going to be something that was productive. And the overwhelming feedback we got is that yes, it's it's very productive. It's a very good use of time. Um, but they did have some specific tips about what the format should be. Um, they suggested that we keep things mostly freeform, uh, but that it's very recommended to start with a few structured sessions. Uh, and so at least initially, that's what we're going to move forward with. Uh, and right for right now, the structured sessions are going to be driven by us on the temporal team. Um, like the one I'm giving to you guys right now, or the one that we're going to have uh, from Mark in a, in a short while, um, just to make sure that we have a stable amount of content um, for these open, off, open office hours and that you know we don't have these huge amounts of, of blank space and um, dead time. But in the future, and I really am, I mean this, and I'm so excited about it, I would love to see community-driven sessions at the beginning of these open office hours. 
if you guys are working on something like a language SDK, or you've just built something cool with Temporal that you want to share, um, this would be, I think, a perfect opportunity. This In the future, I think this would be the exact scenario where those things could be shared um, with an audience. And you, know, you could get very good feedback about um, what people like and what people don't like, uh, which is always super nice when you're building something. And then the last thing about the open office hours themselves is that we really do want feedback about this process. I, I hope it's clear that we don't think we know best or, you know, that we aren't coming here and thinking that this is all figured out. Um, it's very much iterative. And so we really hope that you guys can tell us how these sessions can bring you more value. Because as I said from the beginning, that is really the goal is bringing value to the community. And so if you leave the session feeling like it wasn't valuable, I want to know that. So that way we can try to improve and solve that problem for the next session. Um, so I put my email down there. I hope you guys know that you can find me on Slack. Uh, and please, even if it's something small, just feel free to reach out to me. I, I really appreciate it. Now, the last thing that I want to cover is the guidelines around questions and answers and how we're going to moderate those. Um, so questions can be, they don't have to be questions, first of all, they could be discussions. Um, but whatever it is, we ask that it be related to temporal, uh, at least indirectly. Um, you know, it should be about workflows or something in that ecosystem. Questions are going to be answered on like a first in, first out basis. Uh, we're going to actually just maintain a, Q a queue in Zoom chat. Maybe this won't work out, but we'll see. Uh, and we just like if right now, if you have a question, if you can go and type it in the Zoom chat, and I put at the bottom of this slide under the five to 10 minutes, the format of like a theoretical question. So please just put in parentheses question and then just like colon and then whatever your question is. Um, and we'll just answer them in the order that they're, they're submitted. And I'll make sure that nobody gets a question before everyone else has had a chance. So please try to submit one question at a time. And if you've seen that the questions have kind of died down and all that, feel free to submit another one though. I don't want you to think that, um, you know, you only get one question if we have enough time. And related to that, um, we're going to set a max time. It's a soft limit of like five to 10 minutes per question. Um, and then, you know, after that, we'll either wrap it up or we can move it offline. So that way, if you guys still have open issues and if we didn't answer the question fully, um, you will be able to follow up and get, get the rest of it answered. Uh, we just want to make sure that it's an environment where everyone gets a chance to have their question answered and it doesn't feel like anyone's dominating the time. And then in the future, I, I'm not sure because of you know how many people are here tonight, I think as we grow, this will become more important, but uh, we might eventually end up moving some questions to, I think they call it a Zoom breakout room. Uh, and that way, you know, if we have a question that is incredibly narrow or niche, uh, the main room doesn't need to be dominated by that question and people, uh, you know, be, it might not be of value to the majority of, of users. And so if we have a question like that in the future, we might move it off into a separate room um, and send one team member who can answer it there. So now that we've got all the administrative stuff out of the way, I want to talk just very briefly about what's coming up in the V1 release at a high level. There's a ton of great changes that are slated in V1, and I think it's really, really exciting that you know we've had this period of time to make breaking changes and improve things that you know were bugging us about Cadence for so long. Um, so I just want to highlight a few of those things. So to me, the biggest thing is that we have migrated um, from T-Channel and, and Thrift to gRPC. And this has completely changed our story around security and authentication. Um, you know, before it was very difficult to have things encrypted on the wire. Uh, and now that G we have gRPC, uh, it enables TLS support out of the box, which means that you can have all of your communication when you're running Temporal encrypted. I think that this is, it's so fundamental that it just enables a ton of use cases which couldn't have worked before on the system and a lot of people that weren't served by Cadence are now going to be served by Temporal. Um, and kind of as a testament to that, you know, the, from my experience, from the data that I've seen, um, the number one reason why people are migrating from Cadence to Temporal today is because of this GR, gRPC support. Um, so it really is huge. And then also from like a personal perspective, I'm really excited because it makes some things like HTTP triggers a lot easier to implement. Um, and it, that opens up a lot of use cases in itself. So the next thing that I wanted to touch on is timeouts and retries. 
So we've gotten a lot of feedback, you know, even in the, the first few weeks that I was here, it was like one of the overwhelming things that I noticed is that like timeouts and retries, the, the concepts and the ways that we presented them was very unfriendly. Uh, a lot of people were having problems and they didn't know which values that they should put. And in a lot of cases, it was actually causing problems in the applications, right? Um, you could easily misconfigure things. And so from like a product point of view, that's always one of the situations where you want to address quickly where, you know, there's not just a potential for something to not work. Um, it's a potential for something to cause damage. Uh, and so we really tried to understand where users were getting value out of these things. Um, which timeouts and retries people were continuously configuring and not just relying on, you know, some default value. Uh, and so in those areas, you know, we wanted to make them more front and center and make it more uh, intuitive. Uh, and then in the timeout and retry configuration options that weren't being used as much, um, we kind of wanted to do the opposite and, you know, provide default values for those that didn't have it before uh, and kind of push them to the side. So unless you're someone who's doing something pretty advanced, uh, you won't usually ever have to touch it. And so I think the result is really great. Um, there's been a ton of simplification across the board. Many of the options are gone altogether. Um, quite a few now have default values when they didn't before. Uh, so you should run into a lot less situations where you're frustrated by the timeouts and retries and a lot more where you feel like, oh, wow, this is actually providing value to my application. So the next thing is that, you know, for a long time when we were still Cadence, we were relying on a Helm chart from an external contributor, uh, Bonsai Cloud. And we're so grateful that Bonsai Cloud was able to do that for us. And, you know, for a long time, Bonsai Cloud was our Kubernetes story and their Helm chart was our Kubernetes story. And so, you know, when we decided to fork Cadence and become temporal and we formed a business, we realized that it didn't make sense to rely on an external contributor for something this, this critical um, and this important. And so we decided for V1 that we were going to take responsibility. Uh, mostly, mostly Mark was going to take responsibility for the Helm experience uh, and the Kubernetes experience with Temporal. And so he spent a lot of effort and time in this last you know, few months um, refining our Helm chart and porting it to work with Temporal. Uh, and I think the result is awesome. I think that you know, the, Helm, the Helm chart, it works just as well as it did with uh, the, Cadence, the Cadence Helm chart, except there's even more things that are supported. Um, you know, the, it's been refined. And, you know, he's really been doing a lot of testing with Kubernetes uh, and Temporal. And so I think it's really kind of created an experience which is just above and beyond what we had in the past. Um, and so I'm super duper excited about that. And he's actually going to give a demo um, later in the session. And so you guys will be able to see that, you know, the real deal. And so there's just a few other miscellaneous things that I want to cover. Um, one of the big things is that we simplified uh, SQL schemas. And so it's a lot easier to do migrations. Um, a lot of things that were as defined as first class fields in the schema before have been moved down into a blob. Uh, and those are encapsulated and communicated through protobuf, uh, which means that there's a lot less things that uh, cause breaking changes in the system now in terms of the schemas, um, because a lot of the times it's just within that blob in proto and you don't actually need to do an update of the schema itself. So that's, that's something really cool. I think that's like one of those less moving pieces, fewer rough edges um, that we're really focused on in the future. And just a few other things. We, we did some renamings. Um, task list is now task queue. We think that's a lot more straightforward. Same thing, domains are now namespaces. Uh, and then some other stuff, we, we made errors chainable. This is something that was kind of hackily supported for a while in Java, but now it's really supported and it's, it's a lot better. Um, the visibility queries are strongly consistent. It's always a nice thing to have. And then I, actually another really big thing is that there were some significant proto changes and there's metadata attached to them now. And so you can actually have custom headers and things within Temporal, which is actually, it enables a lot of things that weren't possible with, uh, with Cadence. And before I kind of continue on and talk about what's next and what we've been working on internally, um, I just wanted to show you guys that we do have a CI CD pipeline. Um, this is something that we realized we needed to have, you know, a really good answer to um, moving forward in the future. And so we decided to start an entirely new CI CD process um, and build out a lot of infrastructure which didn't exist for Cadence. Um, and the rationale there is that, you know, with Cadence, uh, it was mainly built to support Uber. And so anything that wasn't an Uber dependency was not tested continuously. Uh, and even things like, you know, the Docker images that were built, those are not being validated. Those are not being, you know, um, tested. Uh, 
at all when when we were still cadence and so we now have a ci cd pipeline um, and it it does all of these things it validates them it validates all the dependencies not just the ones that are of importance to uber um, so you have a lot more reliability and you can have a lot more trust in the fact that you know this thing that you're you're using has been actually uh, vetted uh, in, in numerous situations now unfortunately it doesn't really make sense for us to open source this at least right now um, but I will say that we have plan on surfacing um, this view, like something similar to what you're seeing here, uh, publicly. And so that way, at least you guys have an understanding, like, oh, is the master build, is it something that is stable? You know, what, are the, what did the test look like in the last 12 hours? Like, did it pass the last, the last nightly? Um, these are all things that we're going to make sure is, is clearly communicated and available to you users um, uh, whenever, whenever you guys want to see it. And also, once again, thank you to Mark because Mark is the, the main uh, driver behind the whole CICD process that we've we've ramped up, and he's done it very very quickly. Uh, and so it's it's really cool to see it come together. And just you know, every day we become a little bit more um, trustworthy uh, in our own testing, and we we even scale things out more and more. And so eventually, I think we'll reach a point where we can be incredibly confident with the changes that we make uh, in a very short period of time. So next, I want to just talk about like what's coming up, um, what we're working on, uh, kind of less actually about what's coming up and more about just what's been happening. What are we doing? What are we focus focusing on as business? And so the main focus over the last few months has been uh, hiring more people. We need to scale up the team. Um, and the main rationale there is that everything that we want to do, um, all the improvements and changes that we have mapped out, uh, they were just they require more manpower, honestly. And so we're hiring across a ton of different roles. We're hiring backend and infrastructure engineers. We're hiring people in like the product side of the organization, technical writers, developer advocates. Uh, and we're hoping that you know, all of these people can help us kind of execute this vision that we have for temporal long-term. And so the main focus, at least for the next couple months, is just reducing the rough edges in the system. Um, we know there's a lot of places where you know, things are less beginner friendly than they could be. And you know, we know, for example, our documentation, our usability in general is something that's pretty lacking and we've gotten a lot of feedback about that. And so one thing that I'm super excited about is that we were able to hire a technical writer recently and he's actually going to be starting for us next week. And so hopefully that person will be able to own a lot of these problems and you know, um, deliver a lot much or a lot better uh, explanations and examples and uh, kind of you know, demos of different things within the system and hopefully provide a lot more answers that you currently have to rely on us for, which you know, it's not just that we want to answer less questions, it's that often we're going to be able to reply slower than you would be able to get the answer from Google or wherever else. And so we're really hoping that this will improve things kind of in, for the entire user experience uh, of using Temporal. And then the last thing, which unfortunately and fortunately I have no, no timeline for, um, but I think many of you guys know already that we are working on a hosted service. Um, and it's not just that it's a way for us to make money, which obviously is always nice, uh, but more importantly for me, like as a product person, again, it's, it's about the fact that it makes the system so much more usable. Um, I think there's a ton of people and use cases which are currently alienated because those same people aren't willing to operate or deploy um, you know, infrastructure to run temporal. Uh, and so just having a hosted service and something where you don't have to worry about all those moving pieces and you can just get the value, like Temporal's core, you know, the thing that we communicate is that we're all about making you deliver more on your business value. And so we feel like by providing a hosted service, we're helping to Temporal deliver more on its own, uh, its own value, right? Because now that's one less thing you have to worry about other than just writing the code that makes your business run. So the last thing that I wanted to touch on tonight is discourse. So you guys might have seen that there were some conversations in the Slack channel uh, recently about you know whether we were gonna pay for Slack. We, we hit a limit recently and a user had noticed that we hit the 10,000 message limit. Uh, and if you guys don't know, when you hit 10,000 message limit on Slack, you can't search past those 10,000 messages anymore. Uh, it kind of becomes a rolling window situation. You start slowly losing messages that are older. And so obviously this was not something that we could live with long term, you know, not being able to search our, our communication. Um, and so it kind of brought up the question of whether we wanted to stick with Slack. And so I spent a lot of time personally uh, researching this problem over the last month or two, uh, looking at a lot of different alternatives. 
And I actually wrote a blog post, which is available on our site now, that dived really deeply into what my methodology and decision-making process was here. Um, but the TLDR is that Slack did not seem like an option that was going to work for us long term. And it didn't seem like something that was going to scale with us. Um, there's a lot of reasons for this. Again, the blog post covers most of them. The big ones are that it's very expensive and that the tooling and the uh, design of Slack is not made for community. So a lot of the things that you would traditionally want to do for a community is very difficult on Slack. Uh, it's sort of alienating uh, people who want to do communities. And so we started a discourse forum. Um, right now our thought is that we're going to maintain Slack for real-time communication. And discourse is mostly going to be for like more of the static support. Um, so like basically anything in the support channel uh, will eventually just reside within discourse. Um, discourse is nice because it's online, so you get it indexed by search browsers. Um, it's also infinitely searchable, even internally on the site. Uh, so you don't have to worry about the 10,000 message limit. Uh, and it's also quite affordable. It's much, much more affordable for a startup than Slack is. Um, so that's one of the other key reasons why we're migrating. And we really do believe that we're going to be able to maintain the same level of responsive support that we provide on Slack uh, via discourse. And so, you know, we're going to be tracking that moving forward. Like the, that's one of the first things we're going to be doing is making sure that the support experience, like in a like metrics way, you know, doesn't degrade. Um, and so just keep in mind that we do have our, you know, uh, our ear close to the ground there. I was looking for the right euphemism. Uh, and we do have our ear to the ground there, and it's something that we're very, very uh, wary of, and we, we are not going to tolerate our support experience degrading because of this migration. And so practically short term, you're going to see us starting to push some conversations that start on Slack into discourse. And we might ask you guys, hey, can you go and post this on discourse instead? Uh, we don't want it to be some sort of like zero to one thing where we just shut down all the Slack channels um, one day and, you know, people are very frustrated. Uh, we want people to really want to move to discourse because I think after you guys start using it, you'll, you'll appreciate it and uh, agree with us that it's a much better uh, long term uh, medium than Slack for this sort of stuff. So uh, I would love to hear your guys' feedback here. Please read the blog if you have more questions um, and then just look forward to us doing that in the, in the short term. And last but definitely not least, I want to pass it over to Mark who has prepared an awesome demo of how you can use Temporal with Kubernetes um, via our Helm chart. And he's gonna go through that and it's it's really, really cool to see how actually, it's really, really easy to get, get started. Um, so without further ado, Mark. Great, thank you. Uh, so my name is Mark uh, and I'm going to do, a, I'm a software engineer here at Temporal and I will do a live demo uh, of installing an instance of Temporal to a Kubernetes cluster, which is essentially actually an EKS uh, cluster running in AWS. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Uh, I assume, uh, uh, okay, so you guys can see uh, uh, my screen, I think. Is that right? Rylan, can you confirm? Okay, great. So, okay, so we have a, we have a repo that includes our Helm charts and we, uh, as uh, Brian mentioned, we leaned heavily on the Banzai Cloud Helm chart. So thank you so much for that. And uh, also to on like community contributions for people like uh, Paul. <laughs> so thank you so much for that. Um, uh, so basically I'm just going to start by cloning the repo. Nothing fancy. Uh, I'm going to make uh, my font a little bigger so everybody can see this. Okay, so we have a uh, temporal Helm charts cloned. Uh, and uh, most of this uh, present, most of this demo, I'm actually going to follow along with the readme file that is included with this repo. So if uh, anybody wants to try this at home, as long as you have a cluster to run against, uh, you can just do that. So the first thing is uh, we want to run a Helm dependencies update to get all the dependencies that our Helm chart requires. So, and while it's doing that, uh, the next command I'm going to run is Helm install. And our Helm chart comes uh, by default, it comes with everything, uh, you know, that is included, basically it has all the dependencies and it happens to include Cassandra and Elasticsearch and a few other things. Uh, so I'm going to run this command and it's actually going to install everything. Now, before 
before I do that, I should probably just look, I just, uh, I'm going to run a kubectl command just so to give you a sense for uh, what cluster, what kind of cluster we're dealing with. So let's get nodes. So as you can see, we have a, uh, how many, six nodes. Uh, I think there are M5 large instances running our AWS essentially. And uh, oops, oops. And uh, just to still get pods, so you can see there is nothing, nothing is running there. So there's nothing there. So now I'm gonna start this command. Uh, I just copied, I'm gonna paste it here. I'm gonna start it. So this takes a few minutes. So, and in the meantime, while this is running, I'm going to run um, kubectl get pods again. And you, you now see that there are some uh, resources being initialized. So pods are basically coming online. So this, this process takes a few minutes. And frankly, this, this is mostly because Cassandra takes a long time to, to uh, get set up and to initialize. And to save us some time, I'm going to, do, uh, I'm going to switch to a pre-installed environment. I'm going to do a little bit of a Julia Child uh, style trick, cooking show trick. So I'm going to cancel this. And just so you can see this, so I'm just going to pick up configuration from a different cluster, uh, our demo two cluster. Uh, and uh, you can, so, and uh, this is uh, the log, this is my screen for when I actually uh, ran the same steps uh, earlier today around two o'clock, right? So I did Helm dependencies update, and then I ran uh, Helm uh, install temporal test, right? So let's just uh, look at what this cluster looks like now. So kubectl uh, get pods. So you can see that it has a bunch of uh, all the services that are there and all the services are running. Uh, it's basically the same configuration, say six machines of the same, uh, same size, essentially, uh, M5 large, I think. Um, now let's go back to, to our, uh, Okay, so we looked at the pods. So now we can actually, so actually one of the things that we are running here is you can see that there is a admin tools uh, pod here. And that actually has a few of our, actually one of the things it has is uh, our command line tools. So we can actually command, uh, connect to that uh, container, shell into that uh, pod. So I think you should be able to see, yeah, so I'm in there now. So I can actually run, um, Basically, like so, one of the tools that you can see is TCTL. This is our command line tool. Uh, so I can run things like namespace list. Uh, so you can see that it listed uh, two namespaces. One is a uh, non such because I tested this before I start, you know, before doing this demo. And one is the default uh, namespace that uh, comes with the system. Uh, so you can run commands for, you can create a namespace. I'm just going to do this just so you guys can see this non touch too. Uh, so it, create, it got created, so I can list it again, so I can see non touch too. So uh, you can kind of see, name, you can kind of see now I can interact with the cluster. So I'm going to exit. And one last thing I want to say is that you can also run a uh, port forwarding. This is basically just a standard uh, Kubernetes feature. You can run port forwarding uh, and that will basically forward my local machines port 7233 to Temporal's front end. So now you can run temporal samples against this uh, installations inside, essentially write your temporal uh, workflows against this uh, installation. And that is basically my demo. Thank you very much for your attention. Awesome, thank you, Mark. Uh, and someone just asked a question, uh, is there a cloud formation template for setting up six machines in AWS EKS cluster? Uh, and I think the answer is definitely no, but that's something that we would love to have. Uh, so I'll definitely make sure I write that down. And actually, we we do have uh, we do have our own Terraform configs that do that. So uh, whether we might want to talk about the open sourcing them, basically. Uh, absolutely, I'll make sure I write that down. Okay, so I don't see a ton of questions uh, in the chat that are already there. So if people have questions now, like it's just I think open. So if anyone has a question, just raise your hand or write it down. Uh, someone asked about upgrades with Helm. Uh, Mark, do you want to field that question? Yeah, so right now, because we don't, uh, <laughs> uh, our initial version does not do upgrades. This is just our first version. So our initial release does not really do upgrades. 
uh, but I expect us to add upgrade capacity or upgrade tooling uh, promptly after our initial version gets released. Awesome. All right. So does anyone else have questions or items that they want to discuss? Uh, if you don't feel comfortable, like, you know, uh, opening up your mic, you can also just type it in the chat as well. If people have been doing more, we're, we're okay with that as well. Uh, somebody asked, at some point, if you have a hosted version, are you thinking about how the transfer would be? Uh, just to clarify, you're talking about migrating, right, from an existing cluster that you're running yourself, like on-prem or something, to a, a hosted version that we'd offer, right? Okay. Um, so I don't have, like, a ton of specifics here. Uh, I think that in some ways it's relatively straightforward just because uh, there's things that we already support, like um, in our cross data center setup, where you can actually do failover to a different cluster. And so, like, doing migrations between different setups in some ways is easy, but um, depending on the versions and all of that can be quite tricky. Um, maybe Max or Samar actually has a better answer here. Like, I don't know, Samar, do you want to uh, elaborate? Okay, uh, so there are two parts to that. Uh, if you don't need to transfer data, then it would be easier. You just use different endpoint. Practically, uh, it will be just endpoint of the hosted version. If you need to do data migration, uh, then uh, I don't think it will come in the first version, but obviously uh, we are having that we already support cross DC replication, which allows to migrate from one cluster to another data from one cluster to another. I think uh, this this feature should be absolutely supported. To tell the truth, I didn't even think about it this way, but uh, now I see it's absolutely reasonable feature to ask for. Yeah, awesome, and I'm, I'm making sure to write it down too. This is all great feedback. All right, does anyone else have questions? How often does the team expect upgrades to happen? Uh, it's a great question. Breaking, uh, breaking upgrades or just upgrades in general, like uh, backwards compatible changes? So I have context. So uh, just in general, our philosophy was always that uh, we uh, will maintain forward compatibility of data. Uh, so, so far as, as it was with Cadence, uh, we never broke uh, our compatibility story. So we will, uh, as soon as, that's why we had actually taken so much time to do V1 release, because we want to make sure that all the backwards and compatible changes which we wanted to do from Cadence uh, uh, are in this V1 release. And after that, we don't plan to do any backwards and compatible changes. Uh, so, uh, so that is very important. We might ch do ch backwards compatible changes uh, with, uh, through some deprecate, uh, deprecation schedule in the SDKs, which would require you to change code. But uh, the idea is that you should be able to upgrade your clusters and continue running your uh, workflows without any problem. Uh, but how frequently we don't have, uh, we, we, didn't, we don't have like a specific uh, um, solution there yet. At Uber, we were releasing every four, four to six weeks. And I believe we will try to do something similar uh, because we don't wanna make huge releases. We will just keep doing the smaller releases, and uh, but you should be able to upgrade from uh, practically any release to the new one without any problem. Uh, but uh, this is uh, up to discussion. Obviously, uh, one one thing which was asked by a few companies already is that can we provide specific versions and builds for them just for them? Uh, because, for example, some people say they don't support this version of Docker or whatever, or uh, or a Docker image. Uh, this is something we could discuss. Um, use them, they just contact us. Yeah, just add because they qualified with a backwards compatible, like just to give you some insight, we are moving into like a much more agile process internally. So um, regardless of like how often we make an official drop of a release, um, we're gonna be putting out features much more continuously as opposed to doing things in like a big batch, um, like we're doing with V1. This is just basically a one-off uh, because we wanna make sure that people have a stable version of the system that they can start using um, pretty soon. Uh, so I hope that answered the question. The, the next question is, I'm new to Cadence and Temporal. Uh, another question I have is, would you recommend installing Temporal on a separate cluster or use a separate namespace on an existing cluster? That is a, one of those questions which usual answer, it depends. 
that uh, at Uber, we actually we operate in one cluster for the whole company. So we. Uh, uh, Max, you clarified he meant K. Uh, he meant Kubernetes cluster namespaces. So I think it's a feature of Kubernetes, right? It's not actually. Uh, I. Oh, I meant Kubernetes namespaces. Uh, I don't know. It's up to you, right? We we really are not very opinionated about that. Obviously, uh, cluster needs resources. We we don't recommend running persistence on Kubernetes unless you really know what you're doing. That's why we already provide a Helm chart. Our Helm chart allows you to specify external SQL and uh, Cassandra and other dependencies uh, already. Uh, and uh, if you use our cluster to play with it, a bit with our system, and we deploy everything there, but it's not the recommended production setup. Production uh, recommended production setup when persistence is external to the cluster. Uh, but then uh, how you run that in the same namespace or separate namespace, um, I, I think uh, it's up to you. Uh, obviously, given that you give enough resources to the uh, pods, because obviously if you don't give enough memory or CPU, it can uh, cause performance issues. And uh, just uh, yeah, misunderstood the question, but I think it's still worth discussion is that uh, we recommend uh, using um, like namespace, which was the main at, at Cadence uh, for different use cases on the one cluster. But obviously there are always exceptions that I can imagine situations when uh, you get very like more important traffic, less important traffic, and you want to make sure that they are isolated. So having multiple clusters is also an option. Awesome. Uh, so the next question is, uh, once the temporal cluster is set up in Kubernetes, what are the typical ongoing operation or operational costs? Um, for example, Cassandra backups, Cassandra scaling. I, yeah, I can take that. Go back and see. Yeah. So um, uh, from like uh, the way you think about uh, temporal is like uh, we call it the application layer. Application consists of multiple roles. All the roles are completely stateless. Uh, then they sit on top of whatever like persistence uh, Cassandra, MySQL, Elasticsearch that you are running underneath the cover to uh, power various parts of the application. So from um, the operational cost essentially on the application itself is pretty low because they are the completely like stateless uh, Docker container and then you can easily scale them out and then uh, like increase the size of the cluster, decrease the size of the cluster, it, it shouldn't matter a lot. The thing that you want to definitely take into account is make sure you have enough visibility into the cluster. We emit all sorts of metrics from the application. Uh, so make sure you have appropriate dashboard set up. Make sure you have a good story in place for logs, uh, which are being emitted by the cluster. So those are the two main requirements essentially uh, from operating, uh, from operationalizing the temporal application itself. As far as your question goes around operational cost on database, once again, like we are not very opinionated over there. So that because uh, 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 operationalizing a data store itself is a pretty involved task and really heavily depends on what are the, how you are running the database in a typical organization. Majority of the times what I see is like people rely on hosted experiences for uh, running those databases. I would recommend, like if you do not have experience operationalizing uh, data stores, my recommendation would be to rely one of the hosted experiences which are out there uh, for running Cassandra as a hosted service or like MySQL as a hosted service or use RDS for instance, or um, things like those. I hope that answers your question. Awesome. Yeah, we did simplify. Uh, there's a single command now to um, upgrade um, the, the database as well in the system. Awesome. Anyone have another question or something they would like to discuss? Because I think uh, we just got through all the ones that were in the chat right now. Maybe there is a question about use case, which you are not sure, for example, if uh, this use case fits uh, temporal model. You could go over that. So yeah, we'll give people a minute. I mean, we're not gonna, you know, uh, we won't sit here if there aren't questions, but if, if there are any other questions, even if they're just kind of like tangentially related, we'd love to answer them. Uh, and we'll do this, we'll make this a continuous thing. So that way you guys have an opportunity if you guys come up with new questions as well.
someone asked, uh, were there any major architectural changes made in the V1 release? Yeah, uh, I can take that one. So um, from the um, major architectural changes, uh, the things that um, uh, Ryland was covering is, uh, the first one is our entire uh, RPC stack is, we had to rip out the entire RPC stack and then replace it. Uh, it used to be uh, uh, thrift over T-channel uh, with Cadence. Uh, the bigger problem with T-channel is essentially it is only supported in, for instance, like uh, Java and Go are the only two platforms where it has even support, client-side uh, support for it. Um, so moving to gRPC uh, was a huge upgrade from that perspective because gRPC is much more open, uh, it's friendly in terms of uh, getting support for different SDKs out there. So this uh, is going to basically light up uh, 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 people who are like building like Python client, Ruby and all of building all those different kind of clients now on top of temporal becomes much more uh, straightforward. Um, the other big advantage essentially that uh, uh, you can kind of call it architecturally, like if you're running Cadence, uh, it is uh, essentially, there's no security story uh, as part of it. So you have to run it as part of uh, like um, in kind of a setup where there are no threats essentially. You cannot expose it outside. Um, um, as opposed to temporal, like uh, now we have uh, built uh, a T. First of all, we have built TLS support now. Uh, like literally you can confirm like over the wire encryption and things like those are now kind of baked in and can be control controlled through the config. Uh, then, uh, but it uh, kind of uh, enables uh, for running uh, temporal clusters within an organization in a much more secure manner. Uh, so that is one of the big, another big change uh, compared to Cadence. Um, other uh, thing architecturally is when we initially started working on Cadence, essentially uh, we were we are on a completely different camp. The philosophy is everything is uh, strongly typed. Uh, so that is why all, we our entire contract all the way down to the uh, database schema layer was completely strongly typed. It worked well for us initially when we only had one store to support. Um, the things are much easier. But now uh, we have uh, support for Cassandra, uh, uh, support for MySQL. Uh, uh, Postgres support is also there, but in a kind of like a half big fashion. Uh, we plan to product, uh, productionalize that. But then there are other people who are working on like uh, support for spanner binding, support for cockroach DB and things like those. Um, so this uh, having this strongly typed uh, philosophy does, is not scalable in, for this kind of a model. So we, we did a lot of changes in our persistence contract where we dumped down the interface enough where it, it literally only blocks goes in and blocks comes out from a database perspective. So the thing that it enables us is now uh, any schema, uh, like anytime we add a new field or change the model of uh, how uh, application is interacting with database, those do not now uh, translate into schema changes. So the number of schema changes going forward will be much more smaller than as opposed to Cadence, which now I think have like 20 versions of Cassandra schemas uh, out there. Um, so, uh, and, uh, the, uh, and uh, the other big architectural, uh, not big, like another kind of small architectural changes, the entire ring for the entire uh, membership uh, as part of Cadence, essentially, the what one of the key complaints that we received always is uh, people have to st uh, specify their uh, seed list to bootstrap the cluster. So we kind of changed that, we ripped it out, and then uh, now we are uh, every time a member comes up, it registers itself in the database, and that is where we kind of bootstrap the cluster from. So in general, I think these are uh, the uh, few like major architectural like uh, changes on the server side of things. Max, do you want to add anything on the client SDKs? Uh, I'm unmuting him. Okay, I'm unmuting. So uh, on the client, I think the most visible ones would be. Uh, 
the, the obviously we did renamings, uh, but uh, interest, from interesting ones, uh, uh, I think uh, errors, how errors are handled. Because uh, before, especially in Go, uh, it was very common for that activity returns an error and then uh, workflow just return like and because just in normal go fashion just returns that error up from the workflow function and then uh, you are waiting for that workflow to complete synchronously and you will get error from the activity directly in the uh, col color of that workflow from the parent from the parent workflow in the child and it completely lost context because it's actually not clear where this error came from because it came from like three level uh, three levels of uh, of uh, practically rpc uh, now we changed that. Uh, we actually added, uh, changed our proto definitions to the point that uh, errors are chained, uh, but they chained across processes. So practically right now, if, uh, if for example, activity returns an error and then child workflow just passes this error up without doing anything to that. And then uh, this child workflow returns it to another maybe child workflow or to the client, uh, you will actually get the chain of errors because we are going to wrap them. So practically every error returned from activity will be wrapped in activity failure which includes all the activity information. If workflow returns error, the parent will get child workflow error, which uh, contains the child workflow information. So you're not going to lose context. Also, this new model works across languages because uh, I think where we use Java SDK and Cadence kind of so similar uh, experience already, but it was very hacky because practically it was serializing Java exceptions and deserializing Java exceptions and uh, it would never work across languages. So right now it works across languages. It means that you technically can throw uh, exception from Python a client, uh, get get it in, in the Java workflow, then refro uh, like just catch the, don't catch that exception and let it go to the Go Go parent, and all of them will be correctly chained, and you would be have all the context. So I think this is the biggest change. Other important changes that all metadata payloads right now uh, payloads contain uh, practically metadata key value pairs which uh, simplifies things like ser serialization, uh, like, um, for example, encryption, uh, compression, uh, different serializers, um, or other change which uh, was asked uh, in Java, we changed from G JSON to uh, JSON for uh, JSON serialization. So that is kind of another change. And there are, there are like tons, tons of other little uh, like uh, fixes which uh, greatly improve experience. And another one which, we, uh, which was mentioned by Ryland is we, we've redone the uh, timeouts. Uh, for example, uh, right uh, most timeouts became optional, and uh, we have less timeouts, and uh, I think they have, they kind of became more clear. Because before, for example, we had the uh, expiration uh, interval on the retry policy, then we had like three timeouts on activity, and it was very hard to make sense out of them. And I think right now we have much better story there. Uh, we uh, one thing which we are going to obviously to do is create good documentation around that. That's why we are super happy that uh, on Monday we've got our tech writer starting uh, finally with us. So we will our documents will become finally profi professional ones, not written by us, uh, like engineers. Um, okay. Uh, and next question was about uh, authorization. So right now we only su uh, support uh, TLS. So practically uh, you can provide different certificates to clients. Uh, but uh, we don't support like uh, authorization authentication this beyond that, but we're certainly going to, to add that. Right? And, and definitely once in the host, once we have the hosted service, this is something that will be supported without a doubt. Yes. Um, uh, any difference in scalability? Um, have the implementation gRPC protobufs a lot for more efficient gRPC? We don't know yet. Uh, we are right now in the, uh, we started uh, doing our kind of scale scale runs, but we didn't get to the point when we actually get, can get uh, good, good data on that. Uh, but, uh, my anecdotal in, uh, kind of, I've heard some, something about gRPC versus T-channel and gRPC actually wasn't more efficient than T-channel, uh, raw T-channel, but uh, protobufs were much more efficient than free. Uh, so it looks like uh, you kind of we, we probably will get similar performance. I don't think we will get uh, a lot of uh, kind of it won't be much more efficient. Certainly, it will be much more standard, and also you get the security and other benefits of that. There's one one more thing I would add. It's like so far our workload, what we have seen is bound by uh, how many writes we can do on the database. So um, and uh, we expect like uh, there is there are uh, no big changes as part of the protocol how we are doing writes. So I expect the scalability uh, characteristics of temporal are going to similar to Cadence from that perspective. 
just to be clear, the question was, uh, has the implementation of gRPC and protobufs allowed for more efficient RPC? Just because it wasn't, it wasn't read out loud. I want to make sure everyone was aware. Of One that. thing which we might uh, explore is the streaming. Uh, we right now still do just request reply on top of gRPC. And we might do streaming for things like long calls and so on. Uh, but uh, that is something we, we decided to postpone uh, until the next year. Like just, we didn't have time to look at that. Uh, we just wanted to port the API as it was. Uh, so the, uh, okay, could you read the question? Okay. The next question is, uh, what are the best practices for responding to errors in a top level workflow? Either those that are returned by the developer or triggered by temporal, uh, example, non-deterministic workflow or timeout. So these are very different. So uh, idea is, uh, okay, so one thing which uh, is not obvious when you come from like normal request reply and service world that uh, you really don't want your workflows to fail. Uh, because uh, workflow, obviously if you have bug or something goes wrong, you want it to fail to get it fixed. But in most cases, uh, you wanna make sure that you keep retrying, for example, the reason people do uh, re uh, do failure because they say, okay, I cannot retry for long, like you, because we are not used to that. And uh, what happens if my downstream service is down? And the uh, usual answer is just put retry policy for five days. Uh, Temporal doesn't have any problem uh, retrying for very long time. So it's uh, in a lot of cases, if you have appropriate retry policies and your code doesn't have bugs, workflow shouldn't fail. Uh, you, they just need to continue. And, uh, and also a lot of failures which uh, are in normal world are not intermittent, in the workflow world, are they intermittent? Even bad, deploy, bad deployment or activity bug is intermittent problem because you can fix the bug and redeploy. And for workflow, which can run like expected to run for a few weeks, if something which delayed its execution for like for eight hours is still an intermittent problem. So you can keep retrying. Uh, the other type of problems is, oh, timeout is another one. I, I absolutely not recommend using time, workflow timeout uh, for any business level logic. Uh, if it's, this is, that's why I, I, right now we actually defaulted to very large value, like 10 years or something. And in the future probably will be infinity. Uh, because a timeout is mostly like for cleanup mechanism. It's like to not to have runaway workflows in de development and things like that. But in a normal production situation, you don't want to time out your workflows. You want to have monitoring on them. And if they take too long, you get an application and you find out why and you fix the issue. But you don't want to time out them. For any business level logic, always use internal timeouts. Timeout is very bad mechanism. It's like kill dash nine. It's like uh, writing business logic of your process to handle kill dash nines coming at random time. It's not what you want. So uh, don't rely on timeouts for any business logic. Use timers, sleep, and any other mechanism we provide. And you won't need to deal with them because again, they're cleanup mechanism. It's like terminate on, on, on time. Uh, Non-deterministic workflow, uh, your code shouldn't handle that. It means that uh, usually that you've got bad deployment or something, you fix your bugs, you fix your issues and redeploy the code and they should continue. In worst case scenario, you'll need to do reset. Uh, who, if you don't know about it, reset is ability to restart workflow from any point. So you can reset workflow to start from the point before the bad deployment. You can even mark the uh, deployment is bad uh, through CLI, uh, practically put the domain, say this is bad deployment uh, ID, and then we'll, uh, we will uh, automatically roll back state of all workflows uh, to, if they were touched by these new, uh, new bits uh, to state before that. So uh, it's a big area of discussion how to do that. We can have separate session on that. Uh, but the basic idea is that, uh, uh, but these type of errors, uh, all, all type of our infrastructure failures are not visible to your workflow. So it shouldn't be a problem. Okay, awesome. next. next question. So I want to ask, is there a sweet spot for the number of temporal server instances? Can a cluster scale with regards to the number of workflows just by adding more temporal databases slash database instances? Yeah, I can take that one. Oh, go ahead. <clears throat> yeah. So um, the the way system is designed is it scales horizontally on your number of workflow executions and you can absolutely start small. Uh, and okay, so first of all, the answer is different going, uh, is going to be different uh, if you are running it on top of Cassandra versus MySQL right now. Uh, with Cassandra, uh, uh, you can absolutely start small with let's say like five node cluster. And as your traffic grows, you can add more, uh, more Cassandra host to it and the system should scale horizontally. The only thing that you need to be aware of is there is this config knob called uh, number of uh, shards. 
as part of the temporal config, which you need to think through and it should reflect that uh, highest scale that you want to get out of a single cluster. So let's say, uh, I think the default value over there is 512 shards, but let's say if you want like to run maybe like hundreds or thousands of workloads per second, uh, you may want to think, uh, pick a bigger value like 4K or 16K shards essentially. Um, so um, in the case of MySQL, at least to, uh, the right now, the where we stand is uh, we do not have the support for uh, partitioning sharding yet. So which means that uh, the, uh, the entire uh, temporal cluster can uh, only run on a single MySQL instance. So you don't, your own, so let's say if you're running on Aurora, so your only options are you can keep on scaling up uh, that Aurora instance and until the, the, uh, the, and eventually let's say you run out of your, uh, the biggest instance that you can get and that would be define the total scale that you can get out of a single temporal cluster running on top of Aurora DB for instance. Uh, that is a problem, that is something that we plan to fix. Uh, and even uh, with our V1, we are uh, investing heavily in making sure our uh, MySQL schema definition is uh, have the right partition keys in it defined. And then we uh, plan to test it with uh, uh, things like a white S uh, to make sure that uh, you can have a sharded MySQL cluster uh, behind white S, which uh, Temporal can talk to, and then you can get sharding uh, of MySQL instances through that way. Yeah, just for, it's by test. That works. Yep. Uh, awesome. So the the next question, uh, and Paul just asked, will this Zoom recording be available somewhere? Yes, it will be. I'll make sure that we put it on YouTube or something like that. I don't know the exact oh, medium yet, but I'll figure it out. Uh, so the next question is, um, what use case or workload does the team use for stress testing? Uh, or are the systems being stressed at lower level interface? So the answer is quite a few, but I'll let uh, Samar or Mark maybe go into the, the details there. Yeah. Uh, so I can take, uh, so uh, we basically, uh, every time uh, the pipeline actually, which uh, Ryland showed, uh, essentially we do uh, various kinds of testing before cutting releases. Uh, we have a bunch of our uh, testing philosophy is first of all, like we try to get like appropriate code coverage number, unit test coverage for various parts of the code. Then we, as part of the system, we run what we call as the integration test. Uh, the whole point of integration test is like there, there is a one box setup, uh, which actually also exists as part of our open source repo, where you, we spin up the entire server and then we run uh, and basically bootstrap all the components uh, and then run various integration scenarios uh, on top of that one box setup. Uh, and then we try to get some code, basically some coverage based on that. Uh, the third uh, kind of testing that we do is like, uh, then we literally simulate what we call as canaries, where we try to simulate how uh, users will be writing application on top of our server uh, through a, basically a series of tests, what we call as canaries. And those tests are kind of written in a way where they are continuously running against uh, server deployment and then trying to test uh, various functionality uh, from the outside. Uh, like uh, using our Go SDK right now, but we plan to write a canary for Java SDKs also. Uh, but uh, so this kind of gives us coverage from the entire SDKs all the way to the server. And then they test uh, things like, like pretty much every feature area uh, of the system, uh, which is uh, available to our users. Uh, then uh, we, the last form of testing that we do is what we call as bench. For bench, we uh, there are two things that we care about. The first one is like stabilization, where we run a particular workload at a pretty uh, high scale, and then we basically try to test uh, different, uh, um, uh, make sure that the system can sustain uh, that workload over a long period of time. So we typically, for example, run those kind of tests for uh, multi days, like two or three days because there are certain character, like we set up a new cluster, we start our bench test with a config uh, to run that uh, workload on that cluster. And like a three, after three days later, we check the result. If things looks, look, looks good, then this is how we are cutting releases right now. 
um so we write like uh, uh, right now we ha have a pretty uh, only two scenarios that we have written as part of our bench but this is the area which is right now we are significantly investing on uh, because we want to get uh, uh, broader coverage as part of our bench testing before we declare v1 relief for temporal and then the last area essentially is failure testing where we basically try to simulate uh, like restart a bunch of roles uh, uh, while these bench uh, tests are running uh, simulate basically like kafka failure simulate uh, database failure uh, simulate like our workers being down and uh, to basically kind of uh, try to simulate the uh, huge backlog on ta uh, task queues uh so that is like a failure test uh, part which we are trying to also make progress uh, on um as part of our v1 release so this is kind of like a rough uh, overview of the different kind of testing we do before cutting our releases yeah and i can't overstate how much progress that we made in that right like you know just in the last two months like since i've been at the company the robustness and like just the breadth of our testing has increased a lot so like we're a lot more confident just even today um, with the things that we're putting into the system than we were a few months ago. Uh, so the, the next question, it's pretty related. Um, Sunny asked, can the scale test results be shared once the test runs complete? Um, so I'll answer that part first. So that is something that we plan to do eventually. We do want to give a lot of visibility into the results of the tests. Um, again, we're not sure if we're going to open source the actual tests themselves, but we're definitely going to make sure that we uh, surface those results, um, not just of the scale test, but of the other tests as well. Um, so you guys know what's happening and you guys can feel confident running things on the system. We, uh, actually, uh, we have uh, plans to have a uh, publicly available benchmark uh, because uh, one, one uh, thing we want to be, uh, be want users be able to do is take the benchmark uh, and uh, configure it to kind of correspond to workload, which is kind of similar to their workload. So actually saying, okay, I want a workflow with 10 activities. Each activity gets uh, this input and output size. And I want to, like, I don't know, put a few slips in there, move through like config file, and then I want to run that with, I don't know, uh, 100 workflows per second. And each workflow should take that time. And uh, then we can practically go and you can uh, bring up your cluster, whatever configuration you want, and you would be able to test it before even writing your application to see what type of load it would sustain. Uh, we are not going to release it as a V1. We don't have time right now to do that, but I think eventually we, and if, if someone wants to contribute such a, a benchmark, we absolutely would work with them uh, to make it happen if you want to do it earlier. Awesome. And then the second part of his question was, uh, it would be great if a corresponding cluster configuration could be shared as well. Uh, we don't have anything to share like today. I actually don't think we, is there any problem? We could probably do that. I don't know in the, the V1 release timeframe, but is, do you see any issues with us releasing something like that, Mac? But right now, my understanding our cluster configuration is just Helm charts, uh, the same Helm charts with everybody. We are not using anything specific, right? No, actually, uh, hardware, I, I think, yes, uh, this is an area of probably we, uh, it won't be, we won't, because for us to document the actual configuration of the cluster, we need to have a benchmark which we can run uh, like in a sustained fashion and then compare results. So uh, we are we are not there yet. So, but this is something right now, the thing that we are kind of focusing on quality of our bit, making sure it can sustain any kind of failures and uh, without going da causing downtime for our users out there. Uh, the actual benchmark uh, on what it costs you to run that cluster, that will definitely, we will make a lot of uh, uh, investments in that, but that will happen uh, post our V1 release. Awesome. Uh, and then Sunny also asked, um, can we have best practices documented on your experience from interacting with various cadence temporal customers? Also pitfalls to avoid for EG, avoid having long history. So absolutely, this is definitely going to be something where the tech writer that we just hired is going to come in uh, and really help us. Uh, I actually have many of these things tracked already. Like I'm just looking at my uh, feature request list. And so like I have a, an item for um, best practices around scaling the system, best practices around task queues, um, best practices around writing workflows, best practices around versioning, and best practices around operating the system. Uh, so like these are all things that we're absolutely um, gonna do and we're actually already tracking and we're trying to prioritize because we know that it's something that a lot of people are running into issues with. Um, so absolutely 100%, especially around things like a long history and continuous newbies. We do see that as, as a common question that people are asking. 
Yeah, and I think uh, even short term, just maybe even having uh, pinned answers on our discourse forum will probably go a long way as well. Uh, Shannon asked, what is the vision for admin tools, the web UI? Do you think the development will be more towards TCTL um, versus the web UI? Uh, so I'll give my like high level view on this, I'll let Max maybe dive in more. But yeah, I think, uh, I don't know if I'd ever say that one is going to be prioritized more than the other. Like I'm a developer, so like the CLI is something that's pretty important to me, but web UI is definitely going to be something that we need to make like a first class experience. Uh, we know that there's a lot of parts today that aren't super um, user friendly and we know that there's a lot of capabilities especially around like managing the life cycle of workflows and interacting with already existing and already running workflows um, that could be like a huge improvement in the system and just generally operating things uh, so that's definitely something that we're going to put a lot of effort into improving I, I don't really know if there's like any sort of like prioritization or for one one versus the other though uh, so like max if you want to expand there Oh, one other thing is that we actually going to redo the uh, TCTL. Uh, we actually uh, redesign. Uh, so we are redesigning that, and we are making. A, a, we have. I think it's a public design doc, right? Um, so yeah. So if you look at, uh, I don't know if you know about that. We have the proposals repo, and there is a doc there. You can review that. So we are going to kind of streamline the the whole CLI experience. Uh, obviously, when we are going to redesign web, we are going to talk to you as well. Uh, and yes, we absolutely understand that uh, web uh, UI is, uh, we use it as well. So we know that it has issues. And uh, certainly uh, there are different scenarios uh, which uh, you use it. You use it for developing workflows, you use it for troubleshooting, you use it for just uh, seeing if your system is in good shape. And right now, just uh, this UI is certainly not very friendly to any of those tasks. So we absolutely will invest in that, but uh, obviously timeline and specifics are uh, not defined yet for that. Uh, what could really help is if you guys have specific things, requirements, um, needs, things that you would love to see, I would love to hear about that. Please reach out to me. That's the kind of stuff like I, I just collect all of this data uh, and it's it's just going to make my life a lot easier when I need to actually spec this stuff out because I'll know exactly what you guys need already. Um, and someone just asked, uh, Sunny actually asked just right now, is there a particular, is there a particular uh, I think there's a word missing there, so it's kind of hard for me, but you were hoping for community contributions, a uh, particular area you were hoping for community contributions. Um, so this one's hard. Uh, like, at the end of the day, we're happy to accept contributions anywhere. I think practically there's parts of the system which are more easy to contribute to than others, uh, just in terms of like the technical depth and complexity that you need um, to be able to contribute to them. So I think like if you're trying to look for an area to start contributing, like any of the you know auxiliary stuff, like in terms of the client SDKs or adding a client SDK or improving the ones that we have, uh, building samples around and just like basically anything that's in the ecosystem of our tools, like you know um, building something that would help support DSL that you're you're interested in, um, those are all things that I think would be really really awesome and would add a ton of value. Um, so maybe Max is more have a one, well. one idea. Uh, obviously, uh, we have awesome contributions for around the client uh, uh, SDKs. Uh, there is a, a Python SDK, uh, which is uh, uh, and like uh, C sharp and Ruby. Uh, so obviously, we want to make sure that their production quality, because uh, none of them was released to the point when uh, you could, uh, you, we kind of support it. And we need to figure out the way uh, we bring them to the same uh, kind of support and quality as uh, other SDKs, but they are fully contributed, at least uh, at the point, uh, like at the state they are. And I think this is awesome because it's, it's I think, uh, I'm pretty sure anyone who started to write the client uh, didn't realize how hard it is. They are pretty complex. Uh, um, they have, we have very fat clients and very complex ones. And we, 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 we will address that. We need to think about how to solve that problem. Uh, one idea which I had is around the acti activity libraries. Because right now, for example, uh, we don't provide any integrations with any solutions out of the box, which is kind of different from any other. For example, if you use Airflow, uh, they have a lot of uh, activities, actions, whatever, to talk to different systems out there. So we had uh, people using us, for example, for data for provisioning. Why we don't have, a and I know that some uh, users of uh, Cadence and Temporal, they uh, have already activities written to talk to different, uh, for example, EC2 services. Why we don't come up with a single repo and uh, all of us together work to have a very well-defined uh, list of activities and uh, which are already predefined to integrate different components. And we can be EC2, can be a lot of other systems, big data and so on and so on. I think there, this is where we won't have time to, to invest in that as a company, at least in the near future because we are focusing on the core product. 
but I think community collaborating on different uh, sets of uh, kind of these activities and maybe kind of child even workflow implementations, I, I think that could, can be really good. And one area is basically, uh, especially like people have ex uh, a lot of expertise, let's say they are running with data dog as a met, uh, ingestion of our metric. So uh, how to integrate uh, metric coming out of temporal with data dog? I think I, I know for sure that out people in the community have already done that. Sharing that, just that uh, their experience, their knowledge base, like how to set up temporal clusters on e e ECS and things like those ways, because people already have that domain knowledge for us to basically uh, start providing uh, best practices for each one of those deployment uh, orchestration frameworks out there is going to be pretty hard. We will try to get, uh, cover the top ones um, as much as we can, but this is one area where community already has a lot of uh, knowledge already within our expertise within them. And then that's a one way to help other uh, community members who are new to the system. And I think another one, which is probably the biggest for us would be actually contributing is just spreading the word. Well, uh, because uh, uh, that, uh, as, you, as you all probably know that uh, our technology is powerful, but nobody knows about it. And uh, it's very, community is pretty, still pretty small. So any, any help there, blogs, uh, talks, uh, we absolutely always can uh, join and uh, attend any talk even talk ourselves but if you can help us organize those and just spread out uh, like uh, make uh, other developers know, uh, know about our, our system i think that, that any help there is absolutely uh would be would be awesome yeah and even if you're just in the planning stages of something like that and you just want input like please let us know i've had a, a couple users say you know i'm thinking about writing this blog post about temporal is there any way you could like to look it over for me before i release it and that's something like i'd absolutely love to do that excite me a lot so please reach out if you're thinking about writing something or sharing something or even just pitching it internally into your company. Like we want to be there to support you and we're, we're absolutely like uh, committed to helping you guys. So I think, uh, uh, is there any use cases, as Shannon asked, are there any use cases from potential users companies that surprise the team? Uh, I have to think about, I don't know if Max, you have any. Uh, I think uh, what surprised me actually that uh, people, uh, the that people run core use cases on, on top of uh, cadence and temporal. Uh, okay, not temporal in production, but in cadence. Uh, because uh, that has really surprised me because when I learned that, uh, unfortunately I cannot like really name, name but uh, even like for HashiCorp, which is public about that, think about it, that uh, HashiCorp, these are guys who actually know how to do workflows, right? Because Terraform is technically a workflow. When they needed to go like to the cloud, they evaluated a lot of solutions. They ended up choosing cadence because they just couldn't find anything close to that. Certainly, that was a, a, a very cool. And uh, and we see all sort of use cases from uh, from uh, IoT to I don't know uh, infrastructure, obviously automation to a lot of business use cases uh, to um, like event sourcing. I I, I don't know. It's a, it's very wide 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 widespread. But yeah, for me, the most surprising thing was that uh, there is so much need for this type of system that people are willing to take risk even before our company existed. Uh, now we at least uh, we have uh, means and resources uh, and we will have more this time to, uh, to support that uh, commercially is uh, even before it was existed, it was just practically me somewhere in like our small team at Uber and uh, no official mandate to help anyone. People were willing to use it in production for poor use cases for some companies. And also uh, a lot of startups. Uh, we see a lot of startups which are practically betting on uh, Cadence uh, as a technology fully. They practically just uh, all the architecture is, uh, is built around it. And uh, we see more and more of those uh, companies uh, uh, adopting, uh, adopting it. One of the interesting use cases which recently came up, I think is, uh, I think there was someone in the community trying to basically start it up a, a project at home uh, to synchronize different playlists from multiple music providers. And it turned out initially when we thought, looked at the use case, it looked like probably won't be like a good fit uh, for te uh, uh, Temple will be a, a, a good fit. But when uh, that user start describing the, how he planned to use it, it actually turned out to be a pretty amazing fit uh, for that particular use case. 
Yeah, the the other one. I mean, there's been a lot of use cases that surprised me because you know I'm like newer to the the ecosystem, so I still have a lot more room for being surprised. Uh, I think I'm generally surprised by how many people who end up using uh, tempo or cadence for like a single use case, which really fits within our well-known patterns, uh, end up trying to use it for almost everything that they do in their company, even sometimes when it's not a great fit. Like it really kind of just shows how much uh, people are driven to continue using the technology. Uh, but I think there was somebody actually trying to. Uh, implement a queue on top of temporal, which sounds like normally like an anti-pattern. They were talking about it in the Slack just the other day. Uh, they were doing a large scale amount of database migrations and like it almost kind of made sense. So the pattern they were doing just because of how unique their, their use case was. So that was one that kind of surprised me recently. Uh, so I think that's, the, does anyone else have any questions? Like I think there's actually been a, a lot of really great questions today. So any more, appreciate it. I'll give people like 15 seconds and then I'll just uh, say some parting words. Uh, Shannon asked, what about support? Can you like clarify that for me? Can we get, con what, what are you like uh, enterprise support, like paid support? Yeah, so right now this is something that we're, we're not like officially entertaining. Uh, we don't have any plans like in the immediate future to provide some sort of paid support. Um, this is something that we're definitely gonna be interested in long-term. Like this is absolutely something in the future that you guys can assume we'll do in some level, but like at least even like, this is probably post the hosted service being out um, realistically. Did that answer the question? or do you want more details there as well? I mean, and, and for the meantime, like the support is just, you know, we're gonna provide that to you guys for free um, as we have been, obviously. If uh, you, your company has very specific needs and uh, you wanna kind of discuss that, just contact us, we are here. Uh, because we understand that everybody has very different requirements and every company is different. So we would entertain any idea, but we don't, we don't have promises around that right now. Yeah, okay. All right, so uh, unless there's a question like the next couple of seconds, I think I think that's a wrap. Uh, I really appreciate everyone like spending the time to come here and you know interact with us and ask us questions and give us feedback about the system. Uh, I'll definitely reach out to some of you like proactively maybe in the, the next week and kind of ask for feedback about how this session went and like what areas we could do to improve it. I think one of the things is maybe having some like uh, topics prepared just in case we do run out of questions so that way we can move on to something that will be like productive in the in the meantime while people formulate more um, but otherwise again it was, it was super cool seeing everyone and uh, having a discussion about temporal so awesome thank you have a great night